In the Museum of Fine Art's latest contemporary art show, beauty is taken from the eye of the beholder. In this case, it's the artist Ori Gersh who determines the bounds of beauty. Jared Bowen recently spoke with him. At first blush, the works of Israeli artist Ori Gersht are pieces of painstaking beauty, an elegant cherry tree branch, a verdant Spanish landscape, and a traditional still life. It's seductive. Beauty is what pulls us all into this work. We can't help ourselves. But it's also, it's like a little lullaby. It sort of lures you in, but then when you least expect it, he does bring in comments about violence. The cherry tree branch is actually a photograph of a tree growing in Hiroshima's irradiated soil. Look more closely at the landscape, and you'll find the carcass of a dead dog. In the still life of the flower arrangement, it is soon lifeless. It is all painstaking work imbued with pain, says curator Al Minor. There have been four wars in Israel since Ori was born. His whole life has been in the middle of an ethnic conflict. He's been a witness to so many moments in that nation situation. It's hard for us, I think, as Americans to understand what it would be like to live in a place where so much history is embedded in everything and violence really is around every single corner. The Museum of Fine Art's newest contemporary art show, Ori Gerst, History Repeating, is a vastly intriguing and revelatory perspective. It's the first comprehensive museum survey for Gerst, featuring 17 photographs and eight films dating to 1998. What I'm interested in is the kind of tension that exists between attraction and repulsion. In his photographs, it's a more quiet tension, a sadness brought on by sudden understanding. Much like the cherry blossom, his landscapes, while gorgeous, are pointed. The serene lake in Boatman was actually a hiding place for Jews during World War II. Same for this spot in the Pyrenees. It's something you can only learn by reading the wall text. I'm interested in this moment where the viewer become aware at what they're actually looking at and the effect that it has on them. From the moment the words are becoming into the equation, the experience can never return to its pure, almost this innocent initial relationship between the eye and the image. Gerst's moving images force a more direct response. In this play on an 18th century French painting, the bird suddenly drops into an abyss. A coin and its history harshly melt away. And in Hebrew, the word for pomegranate is the same as grenade. We see that disturbing definition unfold. You know, cells in our body are constantly dying and new cells are emerging. And so sometimes we'll have personal experiences which will have great effect on us. And the, 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 the shift between feeling untouchable and feeling incredibly vulnerable and hopeless are so fine. In all of Gerst's work, in the obvious and in the more ambiguous, he hearkens back to the old masters. Their DNA is part of his own, he believes. It's a questioning of the past in terms of what were these artists doing? What were these moments in history? Why were they important? Why did they create the ripples through time that they did? But it's also an admiration. They rendered life. Now Gerst adds a voice. And Jared Bowen is here. Well, I'm interested in the technology. So while you're looking at the photograph, it kind of comes to life and it's well, digitized these are, yeah, in there. He has very, you see sort of the progression of his work from 1998 when he has just regular still mm -hmm. photographs, uh, very, very traditional. And then as he's evolved over time, he starts to make the films and then he makes the pieces like the coin melting or the, the, the vase exploding. And that's, um, it's on a digital monitor. Um, so basically it's like hanging your television screen up in the gallery. But from a distance you walk in and you, you, you might immediately think that you are looking at some Spanish still life. And then either the sound catches your attention or you start to see some sort of movement. Or if you get up really close, of course, you realize you're looking at a monitor and not a typical canvas, and that's when it unfolds. And how often does it turn over? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how long the pieces are. They're, they're all just a few minutes in length, including the, the films that you can sneak in and see in the gallery as well. So he has other films, too. Which... Well, that's what's really interesting. I mean, this is a really broad spectrum of work, and I, and I think it's really fantastic to watch what kind of progression he's had in just 14 years. It's pretty remarkable. And so the films that you can sneak in and see, they've sort of set up the way the clock was set up oh, yeah. at the MFA. Very comfortable couches. And I love that you, you sort of walk into this little alley 
alleyway and you turn a corner and suddenly you're confronted with these films, and they're all very disparate. There's one where he had gone to Israel and was wanted to interview a dancer, but what she ultimately does is it's an 80-year-old woman. She's just completely wrinkled. You're not even sure what you're looking at at first when it's really uptight, and, and it pulls back, and she's sort of doing one last dance, and just the way she's rocking in this rocking chair and moving. There's another video with trees falling, and again, it's like many of the photographs. It's of a forest where Jews were hiding during World War II. And suddenly you think you have this serene view, and the trees start falling, and they start crashing, and it's so loud, and, and, and it's very, very startling, because you go from this moment of serenity to, to realizing what's happening. It's, it's, it's very thunderous and startling. Well, he grew up in Israel. What, what are his roots? How did he... Become well, he interested. has. I mean, just growing up in Israel, he's been exposed to, to so much conflict. Um, and both his father and his father-in-law were Holocaust survivors. Mm. Uh, so this is these are experiences and traditions and, and exposure. Father, that's because he's young. Yeah, he is young, but mm. they've all been passed down to him. Um, so he he's he sort of looks at life through this very very dark prism, but I, I think it's an important mm. one. I mean, it, it, we all yeah. know it, it, it lurks everywhere. I was interested to see that because I didn't know what that rocky formation was, and I was wondering what it was. Yep. All right, Jared Bowen, thanks a lot. Interesting. All right, and that is it for Greater Boston. Tomorrow, Boston University concludes that an atmosphere of sexual entitlement exists among members of its hockey team and that everyone from administrators to players are part of that culture. And on Boston Public Radio, um, actually, she canceled. They were going to have Jill Stein, but she's not coming on. That's a shame. All right. I'm Emily Rooney. Good night.